virtual bug fest here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. My name is Greg Skookin, and I'll be your host for today's program. A couple things before we get going. Uh, just a big thank you to our sponsors, BASF, and of course to all of our friends of the museum who have supported us continuously. For those of you joining on Zoom, we're just going to go through a quick Zoom tutorial. I'm sure you're all familiar with, with this already. Um, but captions are going to be available for you this afternoon. To access those, just click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen and then select Show Subtitles. If you want to make those captions bigger or smaller, you can go to Subtitle Settings and then adjust the size uh, with a slide bar right there. For the best view, we recommend the side-by-side -side speaker view. So just go into the speaker view in the top right corner, select side-by-side, -side, and then you can adjust the size of the screens by clicking and dragging that vertical bar. And of course, we want you to use the chat to engage uh, with our speaker and ask really good questions. To get that chat going, we want to know, have you ever had carpenter bees at your house? If so, where were they drilling into and do you love them or hate them? So we're going to learn all about carpenter bees with Dr. Elsa Youngstead. Dr. Youngstead is the Assistant Professor of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University. And there she investigates the effect of urbanization and climate change on insects like the carpenter bee. Dr. Young said, welcome and go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks a lot. And thanks everybody for coming over lunch to learn more about carpenter bees. Can you get my screen shared? All right, does that look great? Looks good to me. Great, thanks. So, Carpenter bees, I think, are probably the most recognized bee in North Carolina, or at least they're the one that I get the most questions about when I go out talking about bees. Um, recording if, in progress. Ooh, recording in progress. Got it. Um, if you did come to the talk earlier this morning, you got a great look at carpenter bees globally and their diversity and some of their interesting habits of ground nesting and being nocturnal. In this program, I'm going to focus just on the ones that live here in North Carolina. And if you do know this bee, you probably know it from one of these two interactions. In the spring, you see females gnawing holes in your wooden structures, and you see males hovering around those structures, maybe buzzing you in the face. Um, and they're really on our radar for those couple of months in the spring. But an individual carpenter bee lives a little more than a year, and some of them up to two years. So what I want to do today is kind of pull back the curtain on the rest of that life cycle and have a look at what they're doing all year round. Because like from my title slide, all these little grubs here hidden away in the nest that you never see are also bees, just as much as the adults that you see flying around. But before we dig into the life cycle and their behavior, um, let's make sure we're all on the same page and all actually talking about the same species of bees. And to begin with, I already mentioned males and females and maybe the different things you notice them doing in the spring, and they're actually really easy to tell apart. Um, the clearest difference is this pale mark on the face of the males, which the females do not have. Their face is entirely black. And you can also notice in this picture the males have much bigger eyes, most likely the better to see the females with when they're patrolling their territories or to see intruders in their territories that they would chase away. And this difference is practical to know because the males can't sting you. Um, this is true of all bees, um, that males do not have a stinger because among bees that do have stingers, it's part of the um, female reproductive tract that's been modified into a defensive um, anatomy. So those males who are hovering um, in front of your face in the spring, you can actually snatch them out of the air barehanded with impunity. So besides telling males and females apart, you also need to be able to tell carpenter bees apart from other species. And the ones I see them kind of mixed up with most often are bumblebees, um, because they can be similar in size and kind of similar in coloration, but there's some really important differences before we get into how you actually recognize the differences and tell them apart. Um, it's important because their biology is so different. Bumblebees live in big social colonies that have tens or hundreds of worker bees in them and one queen who's laying all the eggs. It's a little more similar to like a honeybee style social organization. 
And bumblebees never nest in wood. They nest in sort of pre-existing cavities like old bird houses, old rodent burrows, some of them in the ground. Um, and they're super important crop pollinators. Um, whereas carpenter bees um, do drill into wood. They live in um, alone or in small groups. They're not social like bumblebees. And as pollinators, as you'll see, they're kind of a mixed bag. Um, so to tell these two groups of bees apart, carpenter bees from bumblebees, there's three main things you're gonna look for. The most obvious one that I use when I'm telling them apart in the field is to look at the abdomen, that back section of their body. In carpenter bees, it's barely got any hair on it and it's very shiny. Whereas in bumblebees, there's always velvety hair covering it. It doesn't reflect much light. So that's a really good tell. Also, their general body shape is different. I especially noticed that carpenter bees have a very big head in proportion to their body, whereas bumblebees have littler heads and much narrower faces. Um, my assumption is carpenter bees have to have a lot of extra head space to pack in all those jaw muscles that they're using to chew in their nests. Um, so they've got bigger, kind of more bulbous, round heads. And if you get a really close look, you can look at those back legs, especially in females. Um, carpenter bees have a big brush of pollen collecting hairs all over their hind legs, whereas bumblebees have this kind of flattened area where they pack on a little ball of pollen, but it's not a brush of hairs all around it. So if you see a bee with a distinct ball of pollen on her hind legs, it's definitely um, not a carpenter bee. And finally, there's an easy one to tell the males apart too. As we already said, the male carpenter bees have that bright white to ivory yellowish patch on their face. And there aren't any bumblebees who have that. Some male bumblebees will have like a little kind of blonde mustache on their face, that little tuft of hairs, but the actual sort of skin underneath is never white. And as an aside, nobody really knows what this patch is for. A lot of male bees have either like um, light colored hair or light colored um, sort of skin on their faces. And it's probably got something to do with communication between members of the species um, to show off like how big you are or whatever, but we don't know. So that's carpenter bees versus bumblebees. Oh, Greg, I see you popped up. Was there a question? Yeah, we just had a, a question from Ruxin. Um, was wondering, do the males always have those green eyes like that? Yeah, for our um, Eastern carpenter bee, the male eyes do have a greenish tinge. Sometimes it shows up better than others depending on the light, but it's, it's pretty consistent. Um, and then there's another species of carpenter bee here in North Carolina. We just have the two. Um, and this one is the Southern carpenter bee, also known as Xylocopa micans. And this species is less common here. You see it more out toward the coast, but then much more heading down to like Georgia, Florida, hence the Southern carpenter bee, but they are around. I've seen them as far inland as Raleigh for sure. Um, and to tell this species apart from your porch drilling Eastern carpenter bee, um, the females have a similar body shape, but they're all black. They don't have that sort of golden fur on their back. And then the males, their fur is a little more golden colored and their abdomen is actually iridescent blue. They're really pretty. And both the male and the female are a little bit smaller than the Eastern carpenter bee. So now that you know how to tell specifically our Eastern carpenter bee apart from some of the lookalikes in the state, we are gonna talk about specifically its life cycle. And this diagram gives an overview of their life cycle, which for most bees lasts just over a year. Some of them live two years, um, but the big turnover between generations happens in the summer when kind of the parent bees die and the new kids um, are maturing and coming out. But we're actually gonna start over here in the spring when they're kind of most obvious and then we'll work our way around the cycle from there. And the first thing that happens in the spring is that the adult bees come out of so-called diapause. It's like their hibernating state. Um, and they, in Raleigh, that happens around the end of February, the very beginning of March. Of course, the timing is going to be different in different states or in different parts of the state, later in the mountains, maybe a little earlier on the coast. But when they first come out, it takes them a few weeks to really ramp up their activity um, but by the end of March, at least in Raleigh, you're probably starting to see those territorial males hovering around the nest areas and other territories. And they'll chase other males out of their territories and they'll chase females who pass through their territories. 
And the females aren't always agreeable to being chased. A lot of times, if you watch closely, you'll see females just sort of drop out of the sky and hide in the grass when a male is chasing her. That's what's going on in this bottom right picture here. This is the male hovering um, over a female who has disappeared. I can't even see her in the grass, but she's down there hiding. So she's going to wait for this guy to go away, and then she'll come back out and go about her business. It's not rejection all the time. Sometimes the females do meet someone they like. Um, so this pair was uh, successfully courting, and here they have decided to mate. And once females mate, then they get really serious about nesting. Um, so up to this point, kind of a note on their social organization, up to this point in the spring, um, a bunch of bees have been sharing a nest tunnel together. Males and females are just kind of using it as a dormitory at night. There's not really any um, egg laying going on in there yet. But once the females have mated, they're ready to start laying eggs. They claim a nest for their own and they kick everybody else out. Um, and the males go and start sleeping in other nooks and crannies or unclaimed nests. And then other females um, either have to go start a new nest of their own or some of them hang on and try to sort of share a nest with someone else. And this is a bee um, who has started, who's starting her own new nest. Hmm. I'm not seeing, this is, this should be a video, but I'm actually not seeing how to play it while my screen is shared. Does, do any of the hosts have a tip for me on how to do that? Otherwise we'll just keep moving without the video. Sorry, oh, awesome. there it there goes, go. I clicked on it. <laughs> That's <laughs> all it took. Sorry about that, everybody. So this is a video of a female who is starting her own um, new nest and it'll zoom in on her and you can see she's just using her jaws, her little mandibles to drill into this wood making this perfect circle. Um, it's always such an impressive feat of engineering to me how they're able to make these perfectly circular nests using just their jaws. And this nesting activity is not completely limited to your porch. Um, carpenter bees, of course, existed before houses, before milled lumber, and their natural habitat is dead branches, um, usually dead branches in living trees or dead trees um, with fairly soft wood. So this is an example of a natural nest I found out in the sand hills. In this branch way up here, um, there's a little carpenter bee hole, and I, the bee was using it like this is for real. Um, and then here's one that was in a dead tulip tree sapling here in the Butner game lands, also occupied. So they do nest um, in nature, not just in our porches anymore, but we, they do seem to be more common for us. But wherever they're nesting, once the females have got a nest constructed and kind of the length that they want it, um, then they'll start bringing back pollen and nectar to that nest, which they will start, sort of stash to feed their offspring. So this is a female returning to the nest with a load of pollen. You can see the pollen is just sort of packed all over her entire leg, which is one of the ways you can tell them apart from bumblebees who only keep it in one little sort of contained ball, not over the entire legs. And then in this picture, you can see a carpenter bee doing um, one of the habits that makes them not very well loved, which is nectar robbing. Um, because they have really big bodies, but really short tongues, only about half as long as bumblebee tongues in our area. Um, it's hard for them to get into a lot of flowers and get the nectar out of it, but they're very resourceful. They've got strong jaws. So rather than struggle with going in the correct way, they just bite through the flower and take the nectar um, from the outside. And this doesn't usually result in much pollination, um, sometimes a little bit and a lot of times none at all. And then what's more, some other bees will sometimes start using the hole that the carpenter bees made um, as a convenient way to get nectar as well which can sort of reduce the overall sort of lifetime pollen receipt in that flower. They don't do this to everything, but certainly blueberries and any kind of tubular flowers that it's hard for them to get into, they'll do this. That's not to say that they don't pollinate anything. They're um, great pollinators of passion vines. If you were at the talk this morning, you saw how that happens um, throughout the range of passion vines, including here. Um, and I strongly suspect they're really good pollinators of tulip trees, those big open flowers. Um, they're not terrible at cucumbers either, but a lot of things they just kind of nectar rob. 
So with the pollen and nectar that that female collects, um, she makes a little stockpile at the back of her nest. So this is a nest that we've split open um, very kind of early in its development. So the entrance was over here off to the right. And this is the farthest back um, nest chamber in this tunnel. And the yellow is that pollen and nectar ball that the female has assembled. And then she's laid an egg on it. Carpenter bee eggs are huge. They're almost a half inch long. Um, and then after the mother bee lays her first egg, she walls it off um, with this little wall of sort of sawdust and spit and secretions. And this is a closer look at that little wall. I think they're quite charming. She builds it sort of as a spiral from the outside in. And this is the back side where you can see the spiral. And then the front side, she makes very smooth, the side that she can actually access toward the entrance. So the egg lasts for a couple of days. Here's another shot of an egg that's actually about to hatch. Um, it's on the pollen loaf that the mom made. But this one, you can tell it's about to hatch because it's kind of lumpy. It's almost starting to look like a larva. This is a larva that's a couple days old. And then meanwhile, mom is repeating this pollen collecting and egg laying throughout the tunnel. So she started down here at the end, she built a wall, she made another pollen loaf, laid another egg, built another wall, and so on. So for one nest, you often you'll find about six to eight chambers. And the larvae continue to eat their pollen and grow. You see the ones in the back got a head start, they're a little bit bigger. And this nest is in progress. You can see um, a little pollen pile here that the mom has started, but she hasn't finished making it yet, hasn't formed it into that neat little loaf shape. And so this then is an x-ray of a nest or a few nests in early May after about a month of construction. So what you're seeing here are five separate nests. And I say after a month of construction, but I don't mean that a bee chewed all of these holes in one or all of these tunnels in one month. They reuse them from year to year and lengthen them a little bit each year. So we don't know how long these tunnels were under construction, but the pollen collecting and the egg laying has been going on for about a month. So to get you oriented, this is a redwood board that's a four by four inches by four inches. And you can see in the x-ray, like there's a nest entrance here, and it branches into two separate nests, one of which goes off screen there. And then there's an entrance here that branches into that nest on the right, and then another nest on the left, and that branches up to a third nest um, that's kind of above it in the board. And so, for example, this nest has six big provisions, and then you can see two female bees hanging out there close to the entrance. And this is a situation where one of these bees is probably kind of the owner of this nest, collected all this pollen, laid all these eggs. And then the other one is kind of a lurker that she's tolerating, but who's not helping in the nest the way worker um, honeybees or bumblebees do. She seems to be just kind of hanging out, hoping that there will be some mishap that will let her take over part of the nest, maybe lay that last egg that there's still room for. Some of them have um, just like one, some some nests have just one female, some have a female and one, I'll just call her a lurker. Um, some of them have two lurkers and often those lurkers are ones who will live for two years and also just try and reproduce the next year if they don't get a nest this year. Um, and in this nest, you get a pretty, the one on the bottom right, you get a pretty clear view of the larvae. So again, you can see the ones in the back have winnowed down their pollen balls the most, they've grown the biggest and then toward the front, toward the entrance, they're the smallest. And then finally, back over to the real world out of x-rays, um, we've seen eggs and larvae. There's one more stage of development. Um, these larvae have finished eating their pollen, and the oldest sibling here in the end has actually pupated. The pupa is that transitional stage between the larva and the adult, where all the adult anatomy is developing. But these bees are no longer eating, they're not really moving around very much, and the pupa is just transitioning. So this in this nest, you can see a couple of pupae toward the back. Um, but if you look closely, you can also see a rather serious problem in this nest, besides that I've split it open. Um, there's an intruder here. You might think that baby bees would be pretty safe, tucked away like deep in a wooden tunnel, each with its own little private wall. Um, making its own private chamber, but um, they do have several natural enemies, one of whom you can see here. This larva in the second cell from the right 
um, is actually the larva of a tiger bee fly. And you can see the original carpenter bee larva is kind of shriveled up back there behind it. And so the tiger bee fly, um, this is how you normally encounter one. Um, it's this large sort of dark brown to black fly with some silver markings on it, silver or white markings. And you'll often see them hovering around carpenter bee nests in the summer. And sometimes you'll see them like kind of bouncing back and forth in front of them and they're hosing them with eggs. They lay little tiny eggs that they spray on and into the nests. And then those overwinter. And in the spring, the little larvae, you can barely see them here, but on the head of this carpenter bee larva is a tiny little other larva attached. And that is the larva of a tiger bee fly who has found this larva in the spring and quickly the size rolls reverse. This is the full-sized, full-grown bee fly larva, and that's the deflated husk of the carpenter bee that it was feeding on. And then the bee fly itself pupates. This is its pupa. And then it comes out in the summer. And a lot of the times you can see these. This is the um, shed pupal skin of one of the bee flies, which was um, on the deck of a house I was living in in Sand Hills one summer which had a lot of carpenter bee junk like falling out of nests on the porch. Um, and a lot of that included um, pupil skins from these bee flies. And on the topic of enemies, um, woodpeckers also find carpenter bee larvae to be delicious. So you may come home to find this kind of action on your porch, which is also rarely welcome. And it usually leaves this kind of signature damage where the whole series of nest cells has been opened up and the larvae eaten. And then finally, so we've kind of made it through the life cycle. We've kind of skipped from spring to summer at this point. We'll backpedal in a second. So we've gotten through egg laying, larval development, pupation. And if the bees make it through those threats from bee flies and woodpeckers, they will then um, eclose from their pupae as adult bees. They don't come out right away they usually mature right around early July, but a lot of times you don't see them out of the nest for a few weeks. They're just sort of hanging out in there and then they'll come out and start foraging, um, which is what we're still seeing now. But let's back up. That's We were all looking at everything that's going on inside the nest. Meanwhile, um, the adults of the previous generation have been um, aging and weakening. And so the males usually run out of steam in sort of May, June. All of that territorial hovering and mating effort really burns off their energy faster than they can replenish it. And eventually they just wear out um, and they disappear. The females do last a little bit longer, but you see a big drop off in their activity around June too. The exception is those two-year females who kind of keep foraging throughout the summer. So you'll still see some adult carpenter bees all summer long, even during this lull when most of them have aged or died. So now back to the present, our new generation um, has matured, is starting to leave the nest. And this is what you're seeing kind of now, starting from late July when the females come out of the nest and then the males follow along a little bit later in August. Um, this is a female foraging on passion vine, which is one of the things they're actually really good at pollinating. We do this as a native um, passion flower species that we have here. And you can see that you can tell when carpenter bees have been on those because their backs get really bright yellow with passion vine pollen. And they're not collecting the pollen for themselves, for their nests. They just happen to be the right size that it gets on them and they end up pollinating the flower. And then by September, you might see a few mating attempts, but none of that like territorial frenzy that we see in the spring. Mostly everybody's out just fattening up for the winter. Um, brothers and sisters keep sharing nest tunnels at this point. There's no sawdust under them. There's no egg laying. They're just kind of you know, using the existing tunnels. And this is what you would see inside the nest. This is an x-ray from October a few years ago. Um, again, in one of those four by four redwood boards. This has got a bunch of tunnels in it, and you can see each tunnel has several bees in it. Um, these are probably brothers and sisters. We don't know for sure at this point. Um, but the adult males and females come back here to sleep at night after a day of foraging and fattening up. Um, and this is ultimately where they will also spend the winter. Here's another October x-ray um, in a more 
tunnel filled board, but not necessarily as many bees in it at this point. And so they'll stay in these boards until late February or March, and then the whole cycle starts over again. So from that, you can see we do know a lot about carpenter bees and their life cycle. Um, there's still some questions I get a lot that we don't have great answers to. Um, and my lab is actually doing some research on carpenter bees now to try and kind of get some of these answers. Can't give you answers now, but hopefully in a few years I'll have some updates. Um, but just to give you a sense of what we're working on, um, we want to know how much damage they're really doing and how quickly, and also how much this bothers people. Um, and how much insecticide is even being deployed against them. None of that is really well documented, so we don't know how big of a deal it is kind of environmentally even. So we've started a long-term nesting study, and also um, we're working on a survey of people about carpenter bees to get a sense of the range of relationships that people have with their carpenter bees. Um, I'm also often asked what to do about them. If they're somewhere you just really can't tolerate them, um, what do you do? And currently the sort of published advice from extension is to you know, puff a powdered insecticide into the hole and plug it. We would like a wider variety of answers. Um, so we are currently testing a variety of lumbers of woods of different hardness to see kind of what's the, the point where they refuse to drill anymore. And we're also testing some other kind of low impact treatments that might be able to kill carpenter bees with less environmental concern or off target effects. Another open question is why there are so many in town. Probably it's just that we've provided so many convenient nesting places for them. Um, but what's, how does that compare to their natural habitats? Are nesting opportunities really more common here? And if are there other things controlling their populations in natural settings that are not working in town? And finally, of course, we're curious about what they're good for. We're involved in an ongoing search for potentially useful microbes from inside their nests. And we're also curious you know, to document what else they pollinate, um, what they do and do not pollinate. So that's it for today, kind of regardless of where you come down on the love them versus hate them debate. Um, I hope you do feel like you have at least gotten to know them a little bit better. Thanks, Elsa. That was great. Um, so we do have a couple questions. Um, Carrie um, says that a lot of the nests that she sees are in two by fours. And how do they know not to drill out the other side? How do they know where to turn and you know navigate that space? Yeah, that's I'm curious about the same thing. I don't have an answer for that. They don't seem to have their senses about this are not perfect. I've seen them start drilling into things that are actually too thin and drill right through the other side and just be like, oops, and have to go start a new nest in something better. I've also seen their nests within a board like kind of run into each other um, where there's like a little kind of porthole between the nests um, that I'm sure they did not intend. So I'm not sure quite how they sense it and why they also sometimes make mistakes. And then I had a kind of real related question. So you showed us a couple of pictures of like the in situ nests where it's like in the tupelo tree or in the pine tree. And those branches were pretty small, right? Yep. And so I'd imagine that the space would limit the number of eggs that they could lay. Do you know if the females are laying more eggs in these four by fours and two by fours? I don't know. I would love to know. Um, I'm still limited on the number of natural nests I've found. So I've never felt like I've had enough that I can split them open and see exactly what's going on in there or bring them back and x-ray them. So I'm still on the hunt for those, but I have exactly the same question. And I'd also like to know about the longevity of those nests. Like I have the impression that the natural nests maybe don't last as long. Like maybe they don't get to get extended um, for as many years, either because they're smaller or because woodpeckers get them sooner. Um, so yeah, that would be really interesting to know. Great. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's such a common bee. At least we see it all the time, but so many questions yet to, yet to answer. Um, Kate was wondering, what do the nests do to the wood? Do, are they structurally weakening it? Would, would a deck collapse if it's been attacked by carpenter bees? Uh, also a question I have and something that we're hoping to get at with this same um, project where you have those benches with the 10 different kinds of wood in the seat. We've got 20 of those out around town. 
Um, and they've been out, I guess, for one full nesting season. And so far, nobody has started nests in them. So I hope they will do so soon. But once they do that, we'll know exactly when the nest is starting. And we've got boards that we can take out and x-ray and sort of see how long it takes to remove a certain volume of wood. Because um, there's always like some urban legend that somebody who knows somebody had a shed collapse because it had carpenter bees for 20 years. I've never seen it well documented or like the rate at which that damage occurs. Um, so at this point, I don't feel like our decks are at risk of collapsing. And a lot of times the structural parts of decks and porches are bigger um, than like the kind of two by twos or two by fours that they seem to really like. They don't seem to want to be in anything much bigger than about four inches. Um, so if they're just, you know, in a few deck boards, those aren't really carrying a lot of weight. If they're in the, you know, the pillars that are holding the thing up, then like maybe, but I don't know how big of an effect they're having on the strength of it. Sure. Something we also want to know. What about um, composite materials? Are you including those in your study? Is there any evidence that they could drill through something like that? No, I, we didn't include that. And I kind of wish we had. I don't think that they are inclined to drill in those like, fake woods, the stuff that's like sawdust and glue or any of those things that are like composite and mashed together. They seem to kind of always follow the grain of the wood. And if that's not there, like maybe there's some cue missing. Okay. And then um, Carrie says, I feel like buying reuse the same nest every year and don't make many new holes. Uh, is that a, a good way to keep them in just a few places? Just let them use those holes over and over? I mean, they'll still, like, they'll reuse existing holes, but they'll still also build new ones. Like, if you saw in those x-rays, like, each nest produces several bees each year. And so if everybody is looking for a new nest, like, let's say there's even just a couple of females that successfully come out of a given nest and reproduce, one of them gets to own the same nest next year, and then somebody else has to go dig a new one. So just like from experience around my house, I've got a boatload of these bees. Um, and they, even though they have all their old nests, they're still building new ones every year. Um, and especially as the old ones get torn up by woodpeckers and become less desirable, they start new ones. All right. It looks like we have some folks joining us from out West. Um, and they asked, are there carpenter bees in Idaho and the Pacific Northwest? Ooh, I, so there are a few species out west. I don't have their exact distributions in mind. Um, I know I was in Colorado last summer looking, there were three species there that we were looking for, but didn't see, they didn't seem to be common. Um, and in California, I know there's a few species, none of the species out west. So I can't say specifically about Idaho or the Pacific Northwest, but I think surely. Um, the species that I talked about today is all, Eastern U.S. It stops like right around sort of Mississippi, like the Mississippi or like a little bit west, like they're in Kansas and Missouri, but they don't go much farther west of that, like not west of the Great Plains. There are other species out there. They seem not to be as pesty. They maybe do a little bit of drilling in structures, but not nearly as much as, as ours out here. All right, thank you. And uh, Marcel's asking when they hibernate, hibernate, excuse me, do they sometimes sleep in bee hotels? Possibly. I haven't seen that. Um, I could see males doing that, especially like they're inclined to when they get kicked out of the nest that they spent the winter in. A lot of times they'll go find some other random place to sleep and that could be a bee hotel. Um, I don't really see them using bee hotels for nesting much, um, possibly just because the diameters are often, and bee hotels are often smaller than what carpenter bees are looking for. Um, so short answer, I'm not sure if they if they do overwinter in there or not. If they do, I feel like it would be kind of a one-off, not something that I would expect to see regularly. Okay, and then a, another question from Marcel. Um, how do the babies get out of the walled-in rooms when they're ready to leave the nest? Yeah, they chew through them. Um, once they close from their pupae and become adults, they've got functional jaws and they just kind of break them down, chew through them. And the ones in the back do that first, 
ish. Um, if you were at the talk earlier today, you know, there's like some variation in that. Sometimes the ones in the front develop faster, but often the ones in the back still are ready first. And I've seen that here when I split open nests at that time of year, I'll find adults from the back who have kind of broken down their walls and are mingling with the pupae that were farther forward um, in the nest. And eventually everybody catches up and then they kind of start heading outdoors. And Carrie's wondering if if people should put out lumber four by fours for them, like people build chimneys for chimney swifts. They seem to have their own ideas about where is good to nest. Um, we've done a survey on campus to try and figure out like what they're looking for because the benches all over campus are full of bees, but some more than others. It seems like the ones they really like are in areas that get winter sunshine and that have some kind of shelter over them. So if you've got like, you know, rafters in a shed or something, that's especially a South facing one, that's like perfect. They're going to want that. And even if you put four by fours out somewhere else, they might just be like, meh. So I think there's more to their like nest site picking than we completely know. But once we know it, it might be helpful to like, we might be able to lure them away from things we care about by making something that's even better. But at this point, certainly when I put stuff out that I want them to nest in, they never do it. And then uh, Rexon asked, how long does it take for them to dig the holes in the wood? I don't have an exact rate. It's pretty remarkably quick. Like when I've watched a female starting a new nest, she can like, have a tunnel that she can fit in within ah, a couple of days. Again, I'm kind of kind of guessing just based on what I've seen, but they can make a sizable dent even an hour within a few hours. It's pretty impressive. And I personally enjoy watching the males like guard their little territory. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just it's so amusing to me. And Kate was run, wondering if do bumblebees do this hovering thing? And, you know, sometimes the carpenter bees will hover in your face. Do the bumblebees do something similar? Never seen bumblebees doing that. Um, they, the males don't seem to be territorial for bumblebees. There are other bees who have more similar behaviors. I don't know of any others that will actually like come and hover in your face the way our carpenter bees do. But there are others where... Like if you know those little ground bees that come out in the spring, like March, April, on sparsely on sparse lawns, um, if you catch those at the right time, you can see the males just like swarming over the surface of the lawn, and they're kind of doing the same thing, like patrolling for females who are coming and going from the nest. Um, bumblebees have kind of seasonal mating at the end of the summer, or for some species at the end of the spring. And it seems to be more opportunistic. They don't really have territories that they stake out. And the last question I have is, you don't really hear people being stung by carpenter bees. They don't, they don't do that a lot, do they? Yeah, they're not really defensive of their nest. Like a bumblebee nest, if you disturbed it, they would, they would let you know you shouldn't do that. Carpenter bees, and it seems like in insects generally, like in wasps and in bees, kind of the more, the bigger social colony you have, the more there is to defend and the more willing people are to come out and sting you to protect it. Carpenter bees don't tend to be very defensive about their nests. Um, I've gotten stung a few times, but it's always when I'm doing just totally inexcusable things like catching them in nets or, you know, handling them. Um, but if I'm just like looking at the nest, like they do not care. Yeah, I'll say that we've had a, a nest in our deck for the past six years. And now that I have a young daughter, it's it's just a great teachable moment because I'm not too concerned about the, the bee stinging and she can get up close and watch her dig. Uh, I personally love carpenter bees. And uh, I'll just say thank you for sharing all this wonderful information with us. Um, I certainly have learned a lot about carpenter bee here today. And as I say that, a couple questions came in. So let's let's address these before we sign off. Um, Jennifer, or Sean asked, do carpenter bees lose their stingers after they sting you or something else? They do not. Um, that's kind of an oddball feature of honeybees that that happens. Honeybees, the species that we keep, and then their cousins in the same genus, Apis, like around the world, 
Um, other bees don't lose their stinger. Um, it's like honeybees being kind of at the apex of sociality of bees um, are weird in that way. And the workers are kind of expendable. Once they lose their stinger, they also lose their digestive tract. They're eventually going to die. Um, solitary female bees can't afford to die. Like they have to go on laying eggs, go on collecting pollen. And so it's not worth it to lose your stinger in that situation. So on Monday, we learned that honeybees have mites and some viruses that can impact the colonies. Uh, Marcel wants to know, are there any sort of parasites or illnesses that affect carpenter bees? There are, and we don't know a ton about it, but they do have some gut parasites that are related to ones that you find in bumblebees and honeybees. Um, I know this only kind of because we've got colleagues here at NC State who have done some kind of preliminary screens for pathogens in a variety of wild bees and carpenter bees certainly have some of them too. We don't know how big of an effect it has on their well-being or their success at nesting. Um, and we also, when we open up the nests, find a fair number of those pollen provisions that seem to have gotten moldy, like maybe there's some fungal pathogen that gets in there and kills the larva and grows on the pollen. Don't know a lot about it either, but there's, there's definitely some microbial enemies too, in addition to like the bee flies and the woodpeckers that I showed you. Awesome. And with that, I don't see any more questions. Um, so thank you, Dr. Youngstead, for that wonderful information. And thank you, everybody, for attending. We have a couple more programs here with Virtual Bug Fest. Um, if you go to our store online, you can order a Bug Fest t-shirt. If you join or renew your membership, you can get one for free. So thank you again, Elsa, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Y'all have a nice day. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye.